Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Today's guest is an entrepreneur and engineer who is passionate about leading positive change in the world of healthcare. An Iranian refugee who's been committed to learning from struggle, our guest offers a wealth of insight on how leaders can reinvent, rethink, and replan for a better tomorrow. Named by the Times as one of the top 100 people to watch and recognized by the Health Service Journal as one of the top 50 most influential people in UK healthcare, he is the CEO and founder of Babylon Health, a revolutionary AI and digital health company, which has just become a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. Please welcome Dr. Ali Parsa. Ali, welcome to the Dale Carnegie Take Command podcast. It's so great to have you with me today. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. Well, Ali, you have founded an amazing company, Babylon Health. It's a company that I believe is either about to go public or just went public. I've actually had a chance to see the technology. I know your goal is to really revolutionize healthcare around the world. I've seen your AI-based app, which is incredible. Before you founded Babylon Health, I know you founded another business called Circle. You've been an investment banker. You have degrees, including a PhD in engineering physics. Really a fascinating person and background. Share a little bit about the journey that got you here today. I started life as a average middle class kid. I was incredibly lucky to be born and brought up in a very loving family who was very strong in a set of values. I just lost my father over a year ago to COVID. And the thing about my parents above everything else was just the humility and the set of values they had. My dad was a humanitarian, he even went to jail for it when he was much younger. So we grew up in an environment where it was important to do the right thing. And you can't earn that. That's something that's got to come into you. So I was very lucky. Unfortunately, when the Iranian revolution happened, when I was a young teenager, the universities in Iran got closed and I had to leave the country. So I was one of the refugees. Then I started life on my own in UK. I remember when I arrived, I couldn't speak the language, didn't have anybody. It's a very humbling event is what I think Malcolm Gladwell calls one of those defining difficulties, like desirable difficulties, that if you survive it, it'll change you and it'll help you become who you are. You just kind of work through these issues and you become what you become. And what you described was then I became an academic, wasn't very good at it, became an investment banker. I don't think I was very good at that either. But I was always wanting to do what I'm doing now. And I was in search of that. And like every other human being, we are in search of what makes us whole. And that's different for different people, as you know. Talk about that search. You seem very mission-driven, and maybe it started back even with your parents. What is it about the mission that drives you? You know, Joe, going back to that old situation, there was a time I was a young, I'm a lot older now. I was a native. I then became an immigrant. I kind of feel this is home again. I was well-to-do. Then I became superbly poor. And now I am rich enough. And it really doesn't matter in that journey, whether I saw people who were young, old, insiders, outsiders, poor, rich. What you find is people have the same needs, the same desires. They just have different opportunities. And once you see that and you identify with that, for me, it's important to look at everybody the same way and say, hey, how can you help equalize those opportunities a bit? And there are so many areas in which we don't have equal opportunities for people. And each of us need to pick up a small piece of that and do our little bit to make the world a little bit better than where we found it, right? It seems like that's been an important part of your life, trying to leave the world better than you found it. I certainly want to ask you about Babylon, because Babylon 
really has the opportunity to reach billions of people, to improve the health care of billions of people. Give us a little bit more background about what led you to found Babylon and even some of the defining moments that led to this company that you lead today. And one of the things I discovered is that hospitals are a place that you go in average once every 20 years. And fortunately, if you're unlucky, quite a lot in the last two years of your life. And while a huge amount of attention in healthcare goes there, most of us need much simpler healthcare, but we need it much more accessible and affordable. And we sat back and say, hey, can you do with healthcare what Google did with information? Can you make it accessible, affordable, put it in the hands of every human being on earth? Because remember, Joe, half of the world population has no access to health. Five out of the seven billion people on the planet have no access to a specialist care, to surgery. So this thing, this $10 trillion sector that you and I take for granted with all its issues in the West does not exist in many other people, other human beings who love their kids and their parents as much as you and I do. You mentioned to my background as an engineer and a physicist, those practices teach you is that you take each problem to its small constituents and solve for each one of those elements. And so we started solving how can you make it accessible? So we thought, well, why if we put most of the healthcare most people need on devices most of them already have, right? Then we said, okay, but there is no accessibility without affordability. So where are the costs in healthcare? And the answer is two thirds of all costs are in salaries, in human beings. Doctors, nurses are the rarest assets of any country and they are amongst the most expensive, right? So how can we automate as much as possible of what they do so they can do the more complex, the more difficult jobs? In United States today, 40% of the time of a doctor goes to filling in paperwork. I mean, it's just insane if you think about how much of that time gets wasted. They hate it and it's unproductive, right? So how can we automate that? Then we came back and said, well, actually, even if you do all of that, 70% of costs in healthcare are in for predictable, preventable diseases. We don't do healthcare. It's a misnomer. We do sick care. We wait until somebody gets sick, hits crisis and emergencies, and then we fix it, which is what, Joe, you and I used to do with our cars 20 years ago. We used to drive them until it broke down, and then we fixed it. We don't do that anymore. We buried so many sensors in our cars that will allow us now to see a problem before it occurs or project it. We certainly never wait for an airplane to break down and then say, let's fix it, right? So why don't we do that with a human body? So it was an evolution of our thinking. And my colleagues and my friends in Amazon say often that they are in day one. And if they're in day one, I always tell our team that we're in our one. We have so much still to do. So let me ask you about that, because a lot of times people will look at the finished product of a business, a business that is successful, that's large, that's profitable. It appears like it's a linear kind of a thing from start to finish. What were the challenges you faced in forming this business and in the people side of the business? How did you inspire people around the vision? How did you bring great people together? It's a learning process, and you're constantly learning how to do a better job. Great people want to solve great problems and they need to feel that they can make a great contribution to that problem. So if you want great people to join you, you need to create an environment in which they can be the best. So one of the things we try to do is to be very clear about the mission and then be very honest and transparent about it because you know, a lot of companies write their mission in front of the lift and then that's it, kind of like you read it and then you move on. In Babylon, it really doesn't matter who you talk to. Every person believes in our endeavor to make healthcare accessible, affordable for every person on earth and every person joined to do so. So if you look at some of the people in Babylon, each of them came to us having run organizations of tens of billions of dollars and joined a company of hundreds of millions of dollars today in revenue, why would they do that? They do that because they genuinely want to solve a big problem. 
you can't inspire people with words and meaningless phrases. Great people get inspired with great purpose. And you have to be true about that purpose. And then people will find you. It sounds like that's really got to be the place to start. You start from that place of purpose and people are united around that purpose. How do values tie into that? And what are the values you have defined connect people to the purpose to make sure you've got a culture? Because ultimately you can have a great purpose and you can have a great concept, but if you don't have a great culture, the whole thing will fail. Very true. I think everybody knows it when it was, I think, Warren Buffett who said culture eats a strategy for breakfast. And yet ask yourself, how many companies start by saying, I'm going to create a company of great culture? We start by saying, here is my business plan and here is the spreadsheet for my financials and this and that. One of the very first documents we ever wrote in Babylon was a document called We Are Babylon. And it was entirely around what you touched on, our culture. And we said, look, in a world that you can do everything, we're going to focus on having a big dream. So we're going to focus on big things. And we said, we have three principles, dream big, build fast, and be brilliant. And the idea in there was that you want to dream big, but you don't want to make it so big that you just think about it. You have to stop building it fast because life is so short. And then on the other hand, you have to balance between building fast and building garbage. You have to be brilliant. You can't just say, okay, look, I've built something really bad fast, right? You have to just make it beautiful, make it perfect, make it work really well. The world doesn't need yet another bad product. The world needs great service, great product. And then we stand back and said, okay, so if that's our principles that we're going to choose what to do based on that, then how are we going to act? And we put together six characteristics that every Babylonian who joins Babylon, it's kind of tested against that, right? So the hygiene of joining is that you have to be in the top group of people in your expertise. We try to hire the top two, 3% because our job is really hard to do. So we need people of huge expertise. But there are lots of people who have lots of expertise, but they're not nice people or they're not easy to work with or they're great individual players, but will destroy a team, right? So then we look at who is compassionate. We look for compassion. We're in the business of compassion, healthcare, right? So people who like other people, we look for inclusivity, people who believe they don't have all the answers, but seek the answers by bringing other people to the fold. We look for people who have creativity in this world in which you go through a process versus to try and find new solutions. We are much more about people who find creative solutions because the old saying that Einstein used to say, the definition of insanity is keep doing what you do when it's not working. So creativity is really important to us. Then positivity, it's hugely important to us. I mean, look, I'm a big believer that negative people suck energy from you. I call them energy vampires. And there is nothing worse in a team than somebody who says, I can tell you what everybody else does is wrong. We try to avoid that. And then people who take ownership of what they do rather than tell other people what to do and tenacity, right? What we're doing is really, really hard. It's not going to happen overnight. And we need people who stay the course with a few knockdowns, don't fall off their horse. Now, if you could get those six things right, in my view, you can get going. And you've come across other Babylonians. It doesn't matter if we get it right or wrong, or we fail or you succeed. What you will find, Babylonians say they love other Babylonians because these are decent human beings who've come around the mission and are trying to do their best. And that's all that matters. That's all you can ask for. Have there been times that you found that people in the organization haven't had that? Are the situations that you can recall that were challenging? And how did you address those or overcome those? Look, we fail all the time. We get things wrong all the time. We try new ideas that doesn't work out. And that's fine. You could face a situation that didn't work out. That's fine. The question is not that. The question is, how do you act on it? How do you reply to it? If you 
pick yourself up and say, okay, I tried this and it didn't work out and therefore I'm going to try it again. I mean, I think Edison's approach of like, I got the light bulb because I did 9,999 way that it failed and eventually it worked, right? The things that you have to be super clear about in my review, and I may be wrong, it's controversial, I know, is that if you stick to a set of values and characteristics that you find in your organization, then you should also stick to not keeping people who don't fit into it. I think that if you're negative, you should not be in Babylon. You could be highly negative about the administration of your country, but you have no choice. You have to live in that country. You could be highly negative in a family. You have no choice. You have to live in it. Nobody can expel you. But a company is like a team. It's not like a family. It's not like a country. It's like a team. And if you play team sport, can you imagine you're all trying to win and then two people stand on the side with their arms folded and say, look, what everybody else is doing is wrong. And if it was only left to me, I could do a better job. I mean, it just kills a team's spirit, right? So you need to sacrifice the two to save the other nine if you're playing soccer or whatever it is. A great manager once told me he came in as a CEO and quadrupled the share price of the company in a space of four or five years. And it was a public company. It wasn't doing very well. He came in. And I asked him, what was the single most important thing you did? And he said, a company is like a group of people who sit on the same bicycle, same wheels, but they're all like kind of pedaling. And he said what he observed in his company was there were four or five people pedaling forward. There were two, three people not pedaling. And there were two, three people pedaling backward. And all he did is let the people who pedal backward go. And then what he found was that the speed massively improved. And after two or three who were not pedaling, one or two actually started pedaling, got excited by the people in front of them. And everything changed. And sometimes I think it is about what you do and staying true to your set of beliefs, but not thinking about this as I have to have everybody, whether they fit into my culture or they don't. Does that make sense? And I know today's view is a lot of people say that this is not very popular and we need to create an environment in which every single person can try. I don't find that's the responsibility of a company. It makes complete sense. There have been times we'll have the feeling that we need to save people. We need to make sure that everyone can get on board. And the reality is some people may just have a different vision. Their vision for themselves doesn't align with where the vision of the company is, and that's okay. Then maybe they need to find someplace else. I mean, we could try to work with people and invest in people and so forth. And at the end of the day, it might just not be the right fit. I just don't want to be mistaken by thinking that there is no room for critical people in a company. We actually value criticism a lot. The question is positivity versus negativity. Do you say what we just did wasn't very good and here is how we should fix it versus you say what we did wasn't very good and here is all the people I'm going to blame. That's the differentiation for us. I am always critical of everything we do because I am always searching to do something better. But I am always about, or I hope I'm always about, how do we do it better? How do we pull together and even win more? It's like a football team or a a soccer team or a basketball team who wins. And then instead of just constantly celebrating, think, how do I play better even, right, next time? And for that, you need to analyze what you've done to improve. There's nothing wrong with criticism. There is everything wrong with negativity and destruction. There's a balance, right? The balance is we want feedback. We want people to encourage them to speak openly. And yet at the same time, as long as it's constructive, because there is destructive undermining conversation. Ali, what is your definition of leadership? In your experience, what does leadership mean to you? How would you define it? I think it's in the world. It's to lead. It's not called bring people together and talk a lot. It's called lead, which means people willingly follow it. And people, in my experience, Joe, 
intelligent, great people don't follow a person. They follow an idea and they follow an idea and a direction that they contributed to building. So I am not one for a leader who says, here is where we're going and everybody rallies behind me and we go. I am a much bigger believer in uh, creating an environment in which everybody can collectively decide where they're going, what is it exactly they're doing, and then leave it to them to figure out how they do it so they have full ownership of that. And if you have great people, stay out of their way. Right? Set the direction collectively. Your job is to make sure that you unblock their problems. It's not to constantly interfere. I mean, I've been in companies where I constantly found myself being micromanaged by other people. I know often management feels their job is to tell other people what to do. Sometimes there's this idea that the leader is the person or the commander. They're out saying, do this and so forth. And like you said, even micromanaging. But really, my experience is try to find the best people we can. And how do we make them better? How do we get out of their way? How do we clear a path and so forth? I mean, leaders really are about creating better leaders. I mean, look at the sports team, right? Where the stakes are so high. What do they do? The job of the coach. First of all, we don't call it the leader of the team. We call it the coach. The job of the coach is one, to select the best people who can play for them. Two, to figure out how these people can play as a team rather than as individuals. Three, to find out where the challenges in the way they play together are and how do they improve on that. And four, figure out what other resource those people need, better training grounds, better things. That's leadership for you in a field that is the most competitive I know and often very high stake, right? I mean, I think that Netflix program, The Last Dance, was really interesting because honestly, I think some episodes in that program should be mandatory for most business schools to watch because you almost saw everything that a leader needs to kind of think about in sports. And I'm sure it's true in a bakery shop, right? And it's true in, in anything. It's all about the same principles of how do you bring the best people together and make them work at their best as a team. Ali, as I think about you and really your career over 30 years, I think back about your coming to the UK, about your college, about the different things that you did. Right now, today, you clearly have a tremendous amount of confidence. Have you always had strong self-confidence? And if you haven't, what are some of the things you've done over time to build your confidence, to be able to do the things that you've done, be the person that you are? And my confidence doesn't come from believing we have the answers. My confidence comes from believing we have the tenacity to search for the answers. And I think that that is really important. If you have a focus on knowing you're not going to give up, and I knowing that you're completely open to learn, and I knowing that you have no ideology, you don't want to prove anything, you just want to get to the end result, then frankly, Joe, what have you got to lose? So if you think about it, if you're not saying that, I believe every coffee should be drank from this mug, for instance, that I got in my hand for those of your listeners. And I just believe that the job in here is to drink coffee and any mug, and I'm going to figure out what's the best mug. So you're not attaching yourself to one way of doing something, but you're attaching yourself to the goal, to the end result. And you're also saying the end result is an ever evolving thing because you make kind of set yourself something that kind of doesn't work, then I think life becomes a lot easier. Now, I know that we live in a world that that is not the way the world look at it, right? So for instance, we're going public now and the market asks you, tell me exactly what your revenue is going to be this year and then why is it going to be next year? And then this, and people kind of put themselves in these boxes. And I'm always a big believer that you tell people that's what I'm aiming for. This is what we're going to do. We may do a bit more, we may do a bit less, but we will continue doing what we're saying we're going to do. And even if we have a setback, we will get there. And I think it's really important 
to set that framework, I think it was fascinating if you look at companies who really succeeded in creating long-term value, they were very clear about the prevalence of long-term over short-term goals. I mean, I recently read again the shareholder letters of Jeff Bezos, right? And it's fascinating. Year after year after year, he said, here is what we did the last year. Here is what we are hoping to do next year. And then he always finishes by saying, and by the way, we're learning and we may change our mind because we will always give priority to what we learn versus what we thought we knew. If you do that, then what is it not to be confident about? Because you haven't put your things on anything. You just put your things on, I'm going to learn and I'm going to keep getting better. So what I'm hearing you talk about is mindset, really having a mindset about learning and saying, yeah, I'm going to learn something here no matter what happens. And at the same time, we know, especially if we look back over the last 18 months, how much of a role fear plays for people. Many times people are afraid to take a chance. They're afraid of what happens if they do something or don't do something. What advice might you give to people to overcome their fear based on your experiences that you think about? How do you recommend people do that? I mentioned earlier about the desirable difficulties. I think one of the luckiest things that happened to me, which at the time felt awful, was when I had to leave my country. I was 16 and I became a refugee, as we discussed. And all of a sudden, I was on my own in a country whose language I didn't speak, whose people I didn't know, in an environment I could not even imagine. I faced the kind of poverty I wish on no one. And yet it was all okay. It actually, I was as happy then as I am now, right? I mean, because you had other things, you had youth, you had your vigor, you had all the other stuff on your side, right? And what that taught me is that nothing is ever as bad as you think. And the converse of that is also true. Nothing is ever as good as you think, so don't get too cocky about it, right? And you just have to make the best of what you got. When you think that way, I look at it now and I say, imagine everything goes wrong with everything in my life. I can't imagine getting worse than where I was. That was kind of okay. Like we survived it and we had some good times doing it. So short of losing human beings, short of irreversible things like losing a loved one where you can't find it again, and even that is part of the natural order of life, I don't know what is there that can make you so fearful. And once you think of the world that way, I think you can be much more positive about all the things you can do because we hold ourselves back so much from doing things we want to do because of things that we fear losing. If you think about, so what? You lose it. And then so what? Think of all the things that you lost because you didn't try it, right? So I'm incredibly lucky to have had the opportunity to learn that. I've read, and it aligns exactly with what you've said, interviews of people who are at the later stages of their lives, and they've been asked, what would you change if you could change anything? And most of them have said, I regret not taking risks. I regret being afraid. So people often realize that at the end of their lives, and part of what you're saying is, hey, realize it now, take the chance. I know that one of your admonitions has been about be bold, dream big, build fast, be brilliant. What I'm hearing you saying is do those things and you can overcome fear. So look at what we're doing right now in Babylon. A year ago, at the height of our success in the UK and chance of doing well, at the height of the uncertainties of COVID, we embarked on a journey of taking Babylon into the United States. Everybody told us that never in history before a healthcare company has conquered the US from outside the US. It's never been done before. You will never be able to. Then we came in and we said, we're going to create value-based care models, which looks after your entirety of health rather than a tiny piece of it. And we're going to do it remotely first. People said that has never been done before. Then we came in and we said, we have a great leadership team, but we now are going to almost change all of them to a different leadership team who can run entire organization globally 
and have not run hundreds of millions of dollars, but billions and tens of billions of dollars. And we need to make that migration. And I can go on about all the risks. And when we wrote that down as our aims for the next year, honestly, it was scary, <laughs> hugely scary, right? Because you're saying you're doing a whole bunch of things that you won't do at the same time. And yet today, a year and a half, a year gone, I can tell you, I feel a lot more confident about all of those <laughs> risks than we did a year ago. Can you imagine if we didn't do it? And that's what most companies do. Most companies keep doing what they did and repeat what they did and try to replicate it, turn it into a sausage making machine. And that's why companies like Apple are so special because they didn't just say, I'm gonna make more computers. They said, okay, I've done that. What's the next thing? Then they said, I'm gonna make iPods. And then they said, well, I've done that. Now iPhones and iPads, you know? And they constantly reinvented themselves. And I think that zeal is so important. So when you say, be fearful of what you're going to lose, I think be fearful what you will lose by not moving up. That's right. Be fearful of the status quo. Be fearful of what could be that will never be because you're not taking that chance. You know, in 2019, you addressed the graduating class from the University College of London. You gave them in four minutes, what I think is some of the most inspirational advice that I've heard, and we talked about it a lot today already, dream big, build fast, be brilliant. The fourth thing you said was make others' dreams come true. Why is that an important part of this? That is super, super important that we never forget how lucky we are. That class that you said, how lucky would you be to have the opportunity to study in an institution of excellence like UCL? How lucky are you to graduate from it? How lucky would you be to even be able to get into it, right? And now that you have all this luck and you got it, what are you going to do with it? You have to build your own dream. That's why you got in there. But once you're building your own dream, be conscious of the fact that other people also have dreams. As I said earlier, they just have different opportunities than you. Why not just help them to get through their dreams too? I would not be where I am without the help of other people. I mean, when I left Iran, I was well prepared. They told me what to do. My father like, kind of handed me to the smuggler near to the border. And the smuggler said, okay, let's go. And my father came to hug me. And the smuggler said, whoa, what are you doing? You can't hug. People are watching you. So imagine, you and I are fathers, right? Imagine leaving your child. That's 40 years ago, not knowing there's no mobile phone. There's nothing. You have no idea but do you ever see them or not. My father shook my hands really hard. It hurt. And he said, just stay safe. And just make sure you and I can talk again. And I, full of confidence, left them, fear and confidence. And within half an hour, I got caught. Half an hour, right? It didn't even last half an hour. I got caught at the border. And at the time, in the middle of Iran-Iraq war, if they caught you at the border, they will send you to the front line and basically you clean mines. And the guy who caught me was a dreadful human being, frankly, because he couldn't be nastier to a 16-year-old, a grown-up man abusing a child. And one man who had never met before, never met since, ran and said to the leader, sir, sir, there's a phone call for you. And got this nasty man to go answer a phone call. And as he disappeared, he said, son, run. Run to the border on the other side. I have no idea what happened when that guy came back and saw that this guy let me escape. But a stranger who benefited nothing from his kindness to me helped me be where I am, and I wouldn't be there. And that story, Joe, in my life must have happened a hundred times over. People who had nothing to benefit from me, clients that we grow with, think to help us grow, to bring our vision to life. And I think once you see that, you kind of think you should just be part of the group of people who help others as I was helped and you were helped. I'm sure you have a hundred stories like that to tell. 
I do have a hundred stories. That story is a powerful one, an incredible one, a life defining one. Like you, I found in my life so much value in giving back. So many people have been there at different key points in my life. And I find great joy in helping other people as I think you do too. So it's almost like no matter how much we try to help someone else, we still get more back. It's amazing how that works that way. It's a paradox. Because I think human beings are wired to survive by being social and making sure the tribe survives. I just think that is part of our genetic construction. And I, by the way, never look at it as helping others, giving back or anything like that. I just think it's a natural part of what we do. And as you say, you don't think about giving to your children when you help them grow, right? And do everything you do. It's just part of what you have to do as a father or your wife does as a mother. And that's what I got to do as a human being. You know, I mean, we all do this. It's part of who we are. And it makes for a better society because we all help each other, right? I mean, can you imagine a society in which we just grabbed from each other whatever we had and whoever had bigger muscles punched somebody else and took what they had? What kind of dreadful place would that be? Nobody lives like that. Vast majority of human beings live in a social construct. And that social construct is about helping each other grow. And it makes it for a much more enjoyable life. I mean, I worked in organizations and I'm sure so have you where everybody was against everybody. Everybody was trying to push themselves up. They were political. They were dreadful. I hated going to work every day. And I worked in places that people were joyful. And it was a much better place for everybody. So it's not what you do for others. It's actually what you're doing for yourself by creating that environment so you can thrive in it and you can be happy in it. It depends on the mindset. If someone has a scarcity mindset. They think I'm giving something, I'm spending time on somebody, and that's going to take away from me. But no, it's an abundance. It's an abundance mindset. And I've also found, I'm hearing this in your story also, just great gratitude. And when there's gratitude, it's hard to be unhappy if we focus on the things that we are grateful for. Very true. So true. Those who are not grateful or those who think they've done it all themselves, I just think they never had the opportunity to see those who are facing huge difficulties, how unbelievably difficult it is. Imagine being a woman today of all sorts of ambition, a young girl, and all of a sudden you're in Afghanistan and the Taliban have come to power and you have no idea whether you can have education or not. You want to be a doctor. But you have no idea. And that dream may have been just taken away from you. I hope not. I hope they decide not to take away education from girls. But tell me, if you are a doctor today, is that because you lived in a society that allowed you to study? And it's all of those things. It is so important to remember the context in which we've achieved what we achieved and therefore be grateful for it. I have to ask, Ali, just going back to your story, which is an incredibly powerful story, you did make it to the border and you did make it to the UK and you were able to then ultimately be reconnected to your father and your family. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what it showed you is that things always kind of figure themselves out. And if they don't, and of course, there are many who didn't. But if you worry about the things that don't happen, you're never going to do the things that you will do. And I'm sure if I didn't take those risks on my parents, first of all, I was 16. I mean, think of the courage of your parents to let their child take that risk. The sacrifice they make for better life future for you, what they take away from themselves. And I honestly thank all my lucks for never facing that choice for my own children, thankfully, so far. We can learn a lot about leadership from our parents. We can learn a lot about leadership being parents, empathy and patience and love, humility. Ali, this has been a tremendous interview. I'm very grateful for your being with me. Do you have any final advice for our listeners? We as humans have incredible potentials, capabilities, inherent possibilities, and we should just not deny it to ourselves. 
if you want to do something, just do it. You'll be amazed by the joy that brings. So I hope everybody find their own way and everybody do what they want to do. And if what they want to do is keep doing what they're doing now, that's exactly what they should keep doing. Thank you so much. I can't be more grateful for you to spend your time to talk to me. It's been my pleasure. And again, I'm grateful to be with you, Ali. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us at the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.